thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Allison Susco, Director of Partnerships, and uh, we're excited to get this uh, webinar to you, you guys today. Uh, we're going to get started pretty much right away. Uh, we are going to keep the line muted to avoid any background noise. Please, if you have any questions for us based on what Adam is covering today, type them in the question box and uh, we'll try to get to some at the end and run a bit over if you're happy to join us or you're able to join us. And um, we will, of course, reach out to you with any um, more specific questions to your firm after the call. So I would like to go ahead now and introduce our CEO and founder, Adam Holt, who will be conducting the webinar today. Adam, we're all set. Great. Thanks, Allison. And thanks to all the ASIMAT people that are on the call today. We're going to um, keep this very quick in terms of uh, our pace today. So I really hope that you pay attention. I know we could all get pulled in 100 directions, uh, but we're going to share some of the biggest questions that we get around target maps and financial forecasting uh, and funding of that uh, in the platform right now. So we're going to go through a lot of these things, and many of you have asked for it for years. Uh, so hopefully we're going to give you some new clarity. Um, for our agenda today, uh, one of the biggest questions we get is, what were you thinking when you created this target map? Uh, for some of you have expressed the confusion, some of you think it's the best thing, and I'm going to give you the idea of what we were thinking, because it'll really help inform you uh, on how to use it uh, in the field with your clients. Um, but the real big question that we're going to try to answer is, you know, are we on track? We think that that's pretty consistent across the, the, the industry. Uh, so we're going to talk about how do you manage your settings. That's the fun part. That's not really the fun part. That's going to be about one minute of this presentation, but we need to show you how to actually execute this. Then we're going to spend our time doing a live case study with a household. We're going to do target maps and their cash flow details so you can show how fast we literally can do this. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to answer how you do master this, and we'll give you the resources so you can go and uh, get better at this and do it on your own or delegate it if you want to do that. So one of the things, the themes that we've said across the board with Asset Map, is that uh, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, technical advisors uh, tend to lead with a lot of our knowledge, which I think most of our clients really don't want to know, right? They they don't want to cook the meal; they want to eat the cooking. Uh, and so the hope in try to answering the financial progress or how are we doing relative to our financial priorities really comes from the standpoint that we're not trying to give them uh, the math. We've kept a lot of that behind the scenes. I'm gonna show you how to get some of it. Um, but our goal originally was to show the current structure of a household and all the financial decisions that were being made, at least as they currently exist and all the people and entities that mattered at the top, uh, to eventually trying to answer the question whether we're on track for major goals. And, and of course, uh, we've typically, all of us have used financial planning tools to solve this at a more detailed level. But our goal was to try to figure out, uh, are there really any big red flags and are we moving in the right direction? So whether you're doing this in paper or whether you're using this in a digital environment, it should not matter. In fact, Asset Map, as you may already know, was designed to work in all four of these modalities. The key is that it's the same in all four, paper, remote, digital, mobile, it doesn't matter. You learn it once and then you replicate, rinse and repeat, if you will, in regardless of the environment you're working in. Now, this is really critical. That's why it makes sense for you to understand how do we come up with these conclusions of showing how funded somebody is, because you're going to get those questions from your clients. So let's let's get into it. The key to, to the target map concept was an attempt to answer to the client. We call it bottom line first, how funded you are for any financial goal, whether that goal is today or whether it's in the future. Now, typically, you should be thinking, OK, retirement, number one, it is true. Retirement is the number one target map run. The second one in order is actually life insurance needs. The third is education funding. We're going to do all three of them today. Uh, but we also have the capacity to do long-term care scenarios and long-term disability scenarios and also any other scenario you can think of because you can customize this thing uh, ad infinitum. The idea here was to start out by telling somebody effectively if you were underfunded or overfunded for a project based upon present value math, the same concept that almost all financial planning tools use, is how much you would be short in capital or surplus. And if you didn't have this, the, the capital to fund it, how much would it cost to fund it before the time of the duration of this event starts? In other words, if I could expect that my assets in general can earn an, a, at least a net return of some capital return, how much capital would I have to come up with today to fully fund it or fund it over time? 
And so that's really critical. You need to understand this. Um, the, the interesting thing is over the years, um, because you can apply this concept to virtually any financial goal, and it's what businesses tend to use in their financial modeling. For example, a large company might say, should we open another franchise? Well, they have a cost of capital figure, a number at which they will make an investment or not. Uh, and then they basically put in the inputs of what that, that that investment is expected to return, and it either meets the model or it doesn't. The same logic is here. We just need to communicate it relative to how funded you are. So throughout the years, we did get people and advisors say, well, I really need to understand the logic behind it. So we recently, I guess as much as about six months ago, rolled out the back end piece of it. It's really intended for advisors to uh, error check or to verify or validate their assumptions, but it shows actually the year by year cash flows based on that target math assumptions to figure out where the money's coming from, where is it short, where do we have shortfalls? So I'm gonna show you actually how to use this today. Uh, and then of course, what I think is getting overlooked is the fact that we can report to clients in aggregate how they're doing relative to all of the priorities. Very often clients can't address all of them perfectly unless they have enough capital. Uh, but it's important to know that we can reprioritize and we'll show you this, how you can reorder these uh, to get to a true two-page presentation on where is everything and are we on track and what do we need to prioritize. Okay, so that's what our hope today. Let me go right into uh, platform. So hopefully you're a subscriber of, of Asset Map uh, and you're actually using this in the field with your clients. We put together this household called the Adams family, no relation to me. Um, but the key here is to kind of let's, let's acclimate ourselves on this household. So I'm just going to walk us through this. This is, um, this is Bob and Jenny Adams. You'll see that up there. They're in their early 50s. They have two kids, uh, Megan and Jeffrey, 19 and 14 years old. They also take care of their mother-in-law. That's Nana Adams. Uh, and they have a business partner, John Jones, with whom they own a, a joint company. This, actual, this company owns some rental real estate. Turns out in this case example, uh, Bob and John were, were high school buddies, and they bought, uh, they bought a rental property just to experiment. Uh, and that's uh, and you'll see that here. So in terms of Bob, what kind of work does Bob do? Bob is um, he's a VP of marketing at ABC, makes about 100 grand. Uh, in terms of his incomes in the future, you'll see this is in the future, age 67. He's expecting a government pension we call Social Security. It's about $25,000 in present value dollars. I'm sorry, excuse me, future value dollars uh, that he's expecting to receive at 67. And here's that income that he splits with his buddy. Uh, Jenny is actually a teacher. Uh, she works at School District PS8 in New York. Uh, she makes $75,000. She also is entitled to a pension and Social Security in the future at different ages. You can see that. It's really important in the asset map to, to tend to show this because we want to illustrate that we're being cognizant of future cash flows as well. I'm going to show you how this plays out in a retirement analysis. If we scroll down and look at Bob's controlled assets, they include a 401k. Uh, I'm going to keep my pens here. There we go. Uh, an active 401k, and um, and I'm going to show you, actually, we have planned contributions into this 401k of about $10,000 a year that he's making. He's left an old employer's 401k, uh, kind of stagnant there, that's just sitting there. He mentioned to me that he has some stock options uh, in the future, which maybe I don't know about yet. You can see I've made a placeholder here for a dollar. Uh, I'm going to illustrate how that plays into the retirement plan. He purchased a, a non-qualified annuity from this carrier a bunch of years ago. It doesn't remember why he has it, perhaps. You'll see here's his split interest in the rental property. We don't know if that plays into his retirement plan. He's got some mutual funds he picked up over the years, and he has some uh, permanent cash value life insurance we'll discuss. Uh, if you look at Jenny, she's got an annuity IRA. So this means a qualified plan inside of annuity. It's colored as such. Uh, at a carrier that she can't remember. She doesn't remember who she bought it from, but we just have this as a placeholder. She has a, a Roth IRA for 30,000 and she has an active 403B because she's a teacher uh, with Vanguard for 300 grand. So her dad left her some stock certificates, which they, they look at as either can be part of the education fund and for their daughter, Megan, who's actively in college at 19, uh, they have a 529 plan that they started. There's about 26,000 left. So hopefully you're starting to get a good feel for how this family is shaping up. Because when we do the retirement plan, if you don't understand these elements, uh, you really will be lost anyway. So that's why we're taking the time to do this. Uh, they have some emergency reserves and some checking. So their cash positions, you can see where they're located. 
they do carry some ongoing revolving debt and they have residents of 400,000 and a mortgage with Wells Fargo for 250. Uh, if you look at their protection strategies over the top of them, you'll see that we do know that Bob does have some whole life insurance. That's part of that cash value you mentioned. And that Jenny also has some group term insurance provided by the employer here at the school district. But we did put a couple placeholders here because we see an exposure here with such a high income uh, that possibly this, uh, that Bob and Jenny are maybe both underinsured. We figure they probably have some group term insurance. They just forgot to tell us. And maybe they have some disability insurance through his employer. So hopefully this makes sense to, to most of you. If we look at uh, the kids here, if I look at Megan and Jeffrey, so you understand what they're going through. Megan is actually currently at the University of uh, M. We'll figure out what that is later. She does have current work study. So you can see that net effect of that $30,000 of spend that we're actively uh, uh, having here at the parents level. Um, Megan does have a 529, which will probably all be consumed. This is an education fund. And Jeffrey does have a 529, which is Nana opened for him. That's his, that's his grandmother um, for about $12,000 that she started on her balance sheet. Well, gosh, you might say, well, wait a minute. We need to think of Nana. Yeah, we need to think of Nana because Nana, it actually turns out, is going to be financially uh, dependent on this family because she doesn't have a significant amount of assets. She owns her home. Maybe she gets some Social Security. We know very little. We do know that she has a long-term care policy that she purchased a bunch of years ago for $150 a day. So this will basically defray some of her expenses. And if we're looking at Nana, we might as well look at John as well. And John, we know a little bit about him. John is our business partner. He has a uh, uh, the other interest in this rental property. And you can see this, and we've also put in some placeholders for, gosh, is this gonna affect my client if he dies? So there's some things that are going on here. Hopefully you now understand the Adams family. And that just sounds funny to say. Okay, so what are the things that we need to just uh, make sure that we have right? All of this information, whether it's live fed from another system, one of our integration partners, or whether it's been put in from anecdotally from just conversation, client tells you I've got X number of dollars in this bucket and you put it in. All of this information is going to live feed into our funding maps, our target maps. And so it's important to keep this at the core level up to date. Right, So any changes in this asset map is going to affect all of our retirement plannings because they are continuously live. All the retirement planning and every module we do, target map, is live back to the asset map. Again, changes here will affect that. So that means if we have contributions going into these plans, as you might notice here in this 401k, I've put in a $10,000 annual contribution from now all the way through age 65 when he plans on stopping the work. I've done the same thing for this 403b. I'm not going to show it to you. Um, some information we might want to clarify is, well, gosh, how does this stock options really come into play? Let's say that uh, we get some clarity and uh, he says he works at ABC company. It's $100,000 in stock options, but it's actually, I'm not going to get it until the future. Well, when are you going to get it? Well, I think that I probably will get it. I can do an age or date. He's currently 53. Let's give it to him at uh, 58. Okay. So this is just, uh, we're going to make this up. And as we go along, you might notice it's grayed out because it has no current value. It does not roll up to his current branch. Okay, so let's do that. And let's assume uh, he clarifies, yes, I've got, uh, I've got $100,000 of group term because we're going to run this. And also indicates that uh, he's got a, a, a basic benefit of $5,000 a month to age 65. Good enough. Look how fast that was. That was pretty fast. What I want to do now is I want to figure out how we are funded for our major goals. Let's look at target maps. I'm clicking here on this uh, structure here that shows us this kind of next evolution. Um, and it tells us what to do here. It says, it says, go set your global target map preferences. Okay. Add a target map from a template. View your list of target maps and then edit them. So for those of you that, that haven't done this, you can find all of your, all of your preferences up here in these target map preferences. And so what you're going to see is that the system is going to generate all of the needs analysis based upon these presumptions from my general settings of what are my tax losses, how much embedded tax I want to discount all these in instruments from, when I want to retire somebody, what I expect their net growth to be, what are the scenarios under a loss of life that I want to replace. So hopefully you can see this and, and understand this to a high level. 
it's really critical. We find a lot of advisors don't actually go in and change these. It needs to match what your clientele looks like, right? If you're working with high net worth uh, versus some other, excuse me, one second, what, cough. Disability, long-term care, uh, education might be one that you commonly deal with. Uh, what are those the standard defaults? And of course, retirement, the one that gets used the most. You can include these, not include them, change all of these numbers. It will then adjust all of your preferences. And let me show you what I mean. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the target map section here, and I'm going to add a target map. Well, which ones am I going to run? I'm going to run loss of life for Bob and Ann, Jenny. I'm going to run disability for Bob. I'm going to do long-term care for Nana. I'm going to do education funding for all the kids. And I'm going to do retirement for my core two clients. Notice you could do a custom one or multiple custom uh, templates. And I'm literally just going to run them all. Okay. What's happening right now is all those templates are basically being applied to this household live. And now that link is, is essentially created. What you're going to see is it's going to open us up right into the first one that we ran because it assumes that I'm working on it right now. I'm going to do two seconds of literally zooming back out so we can look at the aggregate and prioritize which, uh, which target maps we actually want to work on. Okay. Of course, I asked it to do a lot on a live webinar. That's always fun. But it's doing an extraordinary amount of calculations. I'm going to actually going to go back and prove this to you that we've now literally run loss of life scenarios, long-term care, I'm sorry, disability scenarios, long-term care, education, and retirement. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Let's look at the first one, and I'm actually going to choose to jump to education funding because it's, it's probably the most straightforward. It turns out, actually, if you look at the kids, um, Megan, we're assuming that we need to cover a certain amount of spending, education spending at 35000 from 19 until 22, that's my template say. I can go in and I can edit all this, but what you should understand is the following. According to this, what's left to pay because she's mid school, we have about $245,000 of cash it would take today, earning 5% of the expected capital in order to fully fund this expense. In other words, I need 245,000 earmarked for it. What is already covered by my existing assets and cash flow? Right now, we have no cash flow or ongoing savings to this goal. So all we have are assets, and hopefully we don't have insurances because that would mean something bad happened. Um, but you can see that these assets, which are not taxable, are already available. So we've got 38000 Pretty straightforward. It basically means to cover the deficit between these two present values, we need 207000 If we have a couple more years, or we're going to fund this for the next, let's say, seven years, I can now calculate how much actual savings we should commit to every month. If you get concerned about this number and say, gosh, that's too much, then give me an inflation factor. In other words, increase my savings over time. Hopefully that makes sense to you. You can see that we can actually tell them what graduated savings can look like. You might notice I go on mute because I'm coughing. Okay. But one of the times, some of the times we need to do, uh, we want to see the details and you can click on this right side over here and it'll illustrate this. Here's where you have a good example of showing the expense and the gap in this coverage. Okay, so these gray bars represent the total spend we plan on making, inflation adjusted. And it does spread them out over the calendar year. So when we look at the actual expense for the calendar year, you can see in aggregate, that this $31,000 is meant to be spent throughout the remainder of 2020, the year we are currently in. It shows the, the two children's ages, in this case, as of today when this was run, and illustrates that we effectively have enough assets between the two 529s, which theoretically could both be used, um, effectively to fund this. So we have actually a, a surplus in this year. If you wanted to see the details behind this, you can click on this header and it'll actually show you the expenses for either one of these uh, events. We're gonna show you that in retirement, you can see it. But the reason why I wanted to do this is because you might say, well, I wanna change some of these headings. So really we know this is Jeff's education expenses and we don't think Jeff is gonna to go to a very expensive school. So we're gonna drop this to 20,000. And now I've just updated 
all of the backwards um, uh, information relative to my target map. So this is the key here is that very many of you are trying to do this live with the client. You can do this now and you can model directly with the client and start to change a lot of these assumptions uh, with them. Let's say it turns out that she's actually spending more or she'll spend more in later years. You can change this. You can actually add additional cash flows uh, and it can handle this as well. Um, in this case, you can see also we can dial down into some of these other instruments by showing when these dollars are considered available for this project. Now, one of the questions we get a lot is, wait a minute, I, are we saying that you're going to spend all of the money you have available to you in the first year or you're going to spread it out? We're not going to tell an advisor that you're going to spend this money 13 or 15 years from now. That's not for the advisor to tell you. The challenge, we don't even know what the returns are going to be relative to what they're invested in. And so I cannot predict to you that this asset is definitely going to be worth something in the future. What we can say is we could say, we know what this value of this is today. And if it is in the future, present value it today so I can know effectively what it's worth to me in today's terms. Um, and so the key is that when we talk about this end of year net capital balance, we're really just burning down each year plus some expected growth rate, the client has told us, um, on how much uh, capital have we retained. In other words, in this case, you can see we need to spend $31,000 left for the remainder of this year. We have, uh, whatever this is, $38,000 to use. That means we have a net savings of that total of money that we're attributing to this goal. And therefore we have a net balance. What does it mean when next year I got to spend another $36,000 and I only have seven? It means we have 30,000 less and you can see we're effectively going into debt. Now you might say to yourself, oh, wait a minute, I can't go negative on capital. Well, for education, people do it all the time. It's why we have a billion uh, and a half in trillion, in, I'm sorry, a tr one and a half trillion in this school debt. The point is, is that we can actually model this as effectively they're taking debt and we could put in a system that says, hey, we pay it off in 10 years and we can model that as well. So this becomes really powerful because it helps illustrate the point in this case that we don't have the capital to fund this. We're probably going to go into debt to the tune of $215,000 if this is what you want to spend on this project. You might have remembered I also had... Um, I had other cash flows, including the fact that she was doing work study. I can include that work study, assume that she actually pays very little in taxes. And throughout the remainder of this duration, I could actually now offset some of this. And you can see now this blue represents the cash flow that Megan is going to make from actually uh, doing some work study during that duration. And here you go. There's the net amount that she's earning to cover some of these expenses. So that hopefully you're starting to see how assets and cash flow and then these light green distributions are coming into play to start rounding out how we solve these problems for the client. Now, in the original part of this presentation, I told you you're going to do this in two pages. What are those two pages? Well, we typically tend to show the client the bottom line, which is the, what it means. Either this singular page, and you can print off this page in a presentation, or you do the aggregate one, which is what I showed you before, which is the aggregate of all of these. And they have might have indicated to you that really what was most important was education. And I'm just gonna move it up to the top here. So I'm gonna move education to the top because I want it to print first. Uh, and then let's say I wanna talk about retirement next. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. I made that number, I'll make it number two. Scroll up. Okay, there we go. So let's talk about retirement for a second because it's the one that most of you are dealing with. Um, and and let's uh, let me show you something really cool that a lot of you don't recognize you could do. Um, let's review what this client wants. Now I've used Adam Holt's template, right? And my template for retirement is typically to tell somebody is calculate the following um, presets, which is I want to replace living expenses at 50% of the total earned income or the total income, excuse me, of both the primary and the spouse or partner. Okay, so what I consider tends to be the household's income. So if they make, in this case, um, I think it was 175,000 plus the 8,000 in rental income, let's call that almost 200,000. Uh, I want 50% of that on an after-tax basis. Okay, so I'm discounting for the fact that they probably pay taxes and they're not going to spend as much as they really make today because they've got to put towards retirement and education. Now, that's where I start. You can change all of this if you don't like that. 
but that's where I start. And I basically provided from age 65 to age 100, a 35 year spend. And you can see here based upon a cost of capital of 5%, in other words, what the client expects their investments to return over the long term, that they would need about a million nine to fund this completely on their own. They also, and most clients, want to do what we call the go-go years versus the slow-go years versus the no-go years. Um, they actually want to apportion a different additional expenses in, let's say, early retirement uh, to travel. So I'm giving them an additional budget of, of uh, $9,400 to travel in the early years because I see people actually spending more money, not less. And then medical expenses, uh, I'm trying to create a, a, a hedge here. And I'm doing this to illustrate to you why or how you could actually do this. You want to add 10 more items? You can. You want to add 100 items? You can. It doesn't matter. Um, it's just going to be work. But the key is that the template will pre-populate a lot of this for you. Um, let me go back here and, and I'm going to actually uncheck medical expenses because I think what's going to happen is this map is going to look pretty poor. Um, and you can obviously check off all these things and, and edit them and change this. So this doesn't have to be my numbers. What do you have that's able to basically fund this? Uh, in this case, we do have Social Security. I tend to think Social Security is going to have a slight adjustment. I will give it a 2% adjustment. So what I'm clicking around and doing here is doing my little nuance uh, validation, is I'm checking and saying, are these ages right? Does this make sense? Uh, does this pension have a COLA? Or is it going to have a tax rate on it? I'm okay with that. Are we going to get these rental incomes during retirement? Bob seems to think so. So I'm going to continue to to pay this actually from 65 to 100. I'm assuming he's gonna pay some taxes. Uh, does it, no, no, he has no earned income. Yes, we have contributions that are considered a cash flow. Now, why is that? One of the reasons that this model works across any level of complexity is because it makes certain assumptions. It standardizes the idea that money coming into the system, whether it's in the future, like social security, a pension, or whether it's in the present, like a contribution, an ongoing contribution to something. It calculates the present value of all of that money to determine how much money you don't have to come up for, from other sources. And so the reason why it comes in as a cash flow is because it actually is an expected contribution to the overall uh, earmark or expense. In this case, you can see these 401k contributions happen today and will continue and and it will already stay live linked to the original data. Um, now he happens to be 53. So from 53 to age 65, I, I would give him, let's say, an inflation adjustment of 3%. Uh, and the same thing for Jenny. Let's hope that they continue to increase their retirement plan contributions. You might notice that I'm saying a loss to tax, though. How does that play into effect for somebody who's actually using a qualified or tax advantage account? The way that we had to do this in order to get to a single page is we had to come up with a concept of an actual loss to taxes. In other words, each one of these instruments is not really worth the gross amount to the client because they can't spend the gross amount. So we're actually discounting that instrument by what we expect to pay in taxes when it is consumed. And so despite the fact that you might think, well, gosh, I don't understand, why are you taking out 25% taxes? Because it turns out the way it works, at least in the math in the US, is that all of this money eventually will have to come out in taxes. I'm gonna give you the growth rate before taxes, um, but then ultimately we're gonna lose this much of this instrument's contribution to the earmark. I can prove that mathematically to anybody if you wanna see it. Um, but the point is that that's how we're treating it. So discount to levelize all instruments and make them all equal at the end of the day. Um, we do have several other instruments that the system did not know to include, for example, dad's stock account. We didn't, why, why would we have that? Uh, no Nana's house. We can't use this. This annuity, I think, was planned for retirement. The cash value, we're going to leave that off the balance sheet, but we could use it as an instrument to fund education. And yes, I want these stock options because they come into play uh, and these mutual funds. Okay, so I've basically now included the instruments that I want. I'm not going to bother going back and adjusting any of this for time. What you're going to see is what it means. It means effectively that, and it says it right here if you need to just tell somebody, it basically means that we're 85% funded to meet this capital required to fund the retirement expense. Assuming a hypothetical 5% expected net rate of return on capital, 
the amount of decimal capital is 300,000. Okay, it says it right there. Or $2,900 of additional contributions for the next 11 years. This is at the, actually the point in which the first person reaches age 65. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why is that valuable? Well, it's super valuable because now I've just told somebody that they're effectively 85% funded. They're going to be thinking about this gap. What are the assumptions? I've got to hit a 5% return to make this work. What happens if we hit 6%? Gosh, we're almost 97% funded, assuming we do what we said we were going to do. Again, the key to this was not to predict the future. The key was to translate to somebody, if they walk in a certain direction, are they going to arrive on time? Okay, so what we tend to do and recommend is that run these and clone them and run them at different rates of return and show the difference between someone basically achieving five, six, seven percent and what that means to the overall um, uh, viability of this plant. Now, I said that I would show you the cash flows because this is where it gets fun. What you tend to see in here is this event doesn't happen for several years. We already said it was 11 years. How does that start to look? from a uh, cash flow detail standpoint. Let's look at the actual expected spend. I included these living expenses and travel expenses. Uh, you can see them coming in here and then dropping off in the later years. Again, we are only looking at the duration for each of these calendar years. So that means January to December, January to December, January to December. And that's why in the first year, it's only looking at the remainder of this calendar year for funding and so forth, okay? So if you see a number that says, well, wait a minute, I, I thought we were saving significantly more than that, it's because the system is discounting how many more days are left in the calendar year. Again, I've told it how many present value assets are available. What is this 90,000 that comes in in the future? Well, let's expand and find out. It is the stock option. So now we can actually put in here assets where we know what the future value is going to be. Or if we know what the present value is today, but we think it's going to grow at a certain rate, we could put that in there. And you could see that event happening like an inheritance or a sale of a business so that you can illustrate when this happens. This is, um, this, if this was happening actually during the cash flow model, you would have seen a spike in here. Um, but what we can also illustrate is effectively what is being 85% funded. It means that we're short in these later years. This may or may not be an issue for a client. They might look at this and saying, well, I'm not going to live that long anyway. I don't really care. Um, that's just, and, you know, someone will live on this fixed income. Granted, we've heard all kinds of things over time, but you should understand how do you effectively use this. Um, and of course, whether insurance proceeds come into the play or you can assume uh, an estate and so forth. Here's the questions we tend to get on this stuff, right? Which is, gosh, I don't, I don't really get it. So you're saying here at age 83, I need to spend 220 after tax. I have 90 expected from multiple sources. What are those sources, Adam? I don't remember. Oh yeah, here they are. Social security, pension, rental income, 401ks and so forth. Oh, look at that. See, I messed up. I assumed that the 403B was gonna be contributed to to 74. I know that's wrong, so I'll just change it. You can see here why it's important for us to go back and sometimes inspect the details because we make errors, right? What are these items here? This is rental income. We assume that that's going to keep continuing after taxes, social security, pensions, et cetera. If you wanted to stop any of these earlier, you can. You can adjust all this. Here's what it means for the client. It basically means at age 88, they run out of capital. It doesn't say that their estate is worthless. I didn't assign their real estate, any of Nana's money. I didn't assume any of their cash was available. Um, I tend to reserve that and not earmark that in retirement. What you should remember about this is that this is only considering the instruments that are earmarked for retirement because I actually earmarked them. Um, and that's important to, to communicate. It doesn't mean that their estate is worth, uh, gosh, 472,000. It means that's how much net consumable resources are available for this goal, right? The number, the real number, the gross number might be significantly higher than that because then you have to add back other assets and instruments we did not include in this model. OK, so I, again, I, I say this to impress upon you the importance of what we're looking at here is how much gas are you going to give me to fund this expected need? OK, that's really the key. And if you're wondering what these green and blue bars are, we've now assigned them to the actual how much of this is coming from cash flow, how much of the contributions are coming from assets 
And if we had them insurance policies, uh, if we were doing a typical, uh, I don't know, life insurance needs analysis, same idea is that it's going to be filled or fulfilled by these different boxes. Okay. Hopefully that starts to answer a really important question. So how do you learn more about this? Um, and how do you, you know, keep customizing this, clone these, add long-term care events, smack in the middle of retirement? Um, these are really powerful in terms of communicating, gosh, how much you know, long-term disability are we short? That's a pretty big exposure, this $3,800. Or what happens if Nana has a, a long-term care event? Can we come up with the extra 5000 a month for that four-year event? Where are we going to have to sell the house? These are important aspects for us to answer without actually telling people to spy a solution or invest a certain way. Just, just identify the problem, please. That's really important. Okay. I know I went through that like super crazy fast. But how do you actually learn more about this stuff? Um, you might already know, hopefully you do, that in the lower right-hand corner, there is a chat bubble that does a lot more than chat. In fact, it enables you to start conversations with our team and answer questions, but it also allows you to find an answer for yourself. So if you type in any of these terms, you will get um, actual videos and links on how to do this. Uh, you can actually even, we have walkthroughs, which will literally a walkthrough tour. It'll tell you, do this, do this, do this, of everything I just said, so that you can actually um, take a guided tour live and you're inputting your data. Uh, and it'll tell you what to do. We also have recorded a significant amount of webinars in this, over 15 hours of content you can read and watch on your own, put on your, on your phone, uh, and just listen to us talking about different topics of business succession, retirement, et cetera. So if you do want to learn more, this is available to you. You can see the URL at the top. Uh, so with that, I'll sign off. Thank you, everybody, for your support and your business. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next event. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Adam.